now. I, I, I'm amazed that, most, that not more people seriously engage with this. Okay, you have you know, Chomsky's descriptions of the propaganda model of the, the role of the mainstream media. So do we accept that the traditional media uh, industries and the way information that flows into it and flows out of it uh, is, a, is a major element of uh, the society that we live in? I, I think most people accept that. Uh, so, so what if uh, that changes? Does that mean other things have to change as well? Of course it does. It, it's, it's like if there was suddenly no um, money in society, no, or no contracts in society, or no courts in society, would the rest of uh, the, the social structure and the political structure uh, change? Of course it would. And so we're moving forward into a, a different form of social relation that exists when uh, there's not a me a me that's not a traditional media monopoly. Okay, but the, so that's that's produced a, a great threat to you know to uh, existing power structures of various forms are uh, uh, terribly threatened by it, uh, and it's 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 not the case that social media is just going to stay there uh, as it has been used in this election and the U.S. election. That's absolutely not true. Um, and we, it's possible we'll end up in a much worse position. So, okay, you've got you know, five big media barons here and uh, trusts and the BBC. Okay, but what if, what if we basically just have Facebook and Twitter? If, if, it, kind of, if it kind of evolves that, maybe Facebook, Twitter and the BBC. Uh, are we in a better position? No, we're potentially in a much worse position. What hasn't happened yet uh, is Facebook and Twitter taking seriously um, uh, how they can uh, control and influence uh, the other power structures that want them to control and influence. Uh, they've just started to do it. But we're, we're going to move to a, a time when um, the various forms of artificial intelligence that have been de developed at Google and been acquired by Facebook and a bit in China are going to be used to uh, to control uh, or adjust perception. So if you, if you imagine uh, a Daily Mail, not run by Paul Dacry, uh, but run by uh, purely or essentially by artificial intelligence, what, what does that look like when uh, you, you, there's only the Daily, Daily Mail worldwide? So that's what uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, I believe will shift into, they must inevitably shift into that. There's al already such intense pressures that uh, Google and Facebook came out publicly and said that they were uh, changing how they were behaving directly to deal with the French election. Essentially directly to make sure uh, Macron won uh, and Le Pen didn't because they were getting such pressure uh, from uh, their um, presumably their elite level connections from their staff and so on, uh, to make sure she, she didn't win. Right, we have two minutes left. One minute left. Can I just make one sentence, yes. literally? Uh, what is so important, I would like to connect what uh, Julian was saying. He just hit the most interesting bit. Yeah. We're just yes. talking yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah, AI yeah. and we're yeah, wrapping yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. And With your billionaire really... friends, you know. Because I know. What game, you know, right. what game <laughs> they play? This is a game that many people play. I secretly know it, but I pretend not to know it. All the dirty things, Iraq war. And what WikiLeaks does is bring in the data. Sorry, fuck you, now you know it. You cannot, because many even of my friends say, yeah, yeah, secret services, army. Because it's not really written by anyone. It's literally the documents and yeah, it gets dropped. Yeah. And those and it, in that power, they cannot pretend that it's not sure, we don't know it. Now they know it. Yeah, but is there a process of gatekeeping in what gets uh, dropped and what doesn't? Because that's what the, 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 the criticism is. Crucial. Yes, right. but the criticism to WikiLeaks is that there is a gatekeeping process. That, that is true. The, the, there is. Uh, the, the process is it can't have been published before and it has to be an authentic document. That's the, yeah. that's the process. And it's, it's not an opinion. It's, it's just the fact. Well, we, we also write analysis, but it, 
but the power, no one, no one really cares about my analysis or WikiLeaks yeah. analysis. I mean, <laughs> like, they really care about it, but, but people basically don't. What, what they care about uh, and what has uh, serious uh, scarcity value uh, is the raw information that we publish uh, because it's, and our reputation for accuracy. So uh, these things combined produce an, uh, an undeniable uh, reality. So when, when used in arguments, for example, as, as Zizek was, was pointing out, you can, you can point to it direct, directly there. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite good, you publish so much, that when uh, an event arises like this current uh, dispute between Turkey and Qatar, sorry, between Saudi and Qatar, Turkey is also now involved, um, that uh, we can go back and look at uh, what we published in uh, 2015 with the Saudi cables or, or more recent material with Hillary Clinton's emails uh, or in the, the big cable sets we've, we've published. Uh, that reveal that this uh, new dispute is not new. I mean, it, it, it emerges uh, from all sorts of um, uh, regional power conflicts from uh, Saudi, from the internal tensions in Saudi Arabia, which have been uh, dealt with by creating external uh, enemies from the use of Al Jazeera as a, as a kind of uh, uh, a poor man's nuclear weapon. A poor man's deterrent uh, by by Qatar, um, Qatar's geogra geographical uh, positioning in relation to Saudi Arabia and so on. So it's yeah. So I, I mean, we the press speaks about WikiLeaks as if it's a scandal generator, and that it exposes certain people and harms them. Uh, but the way I have always seen the the value of what we do uh, is that. WikiLeaks is a, is a rebel library of Alexandria, uh, where every book in it uh, is accurate. It doesn't mean every, every phrase on every page is accurate, because governments write inaccurate things, but nonetheless, uh, the books themselves are accurate. And um, that's in a, as we have an informational cacophony, uh, uh, and, can I, and everyone's can I... able to give an opinion, uh, what we need is some kind of firm uh, scaffolding that you can rely on to build uh, opinions and particular political movements and views. Uh, and that has to be some kind of uh, library that you can trust about how the world actually works. That is something that exists independently of a particular political movement. It's something in a way that exists uh, independently uh, of the particular uh, times that we're in, that we're in, just as if, as we can go back and look at uh, very old books to understand uh, afresh something about what uh, something about the time that we live in, because they were written uh, prior to just this moment. So they were not written uh, with a, an attempt to manipulate us uh, in our understanding at precisely this moment. They were written about a, a slightly earlier situation, well, a very ancient situation, or in the case of WikiLeaks, you know, something that's a few weeks or a few years old. I wanted to ask about AI again, just because we're running over anyway. Um, <laughs> so musicians who are sort of encouraged to um, obviously embrace AR technology and uh, VR technology and AI technology, and uh, it's being sold to us as something that is amazing to become a hologram or have a 3D experience where, you know, you don't have to go out and do tours and people could put headsets on and you'd be there in the room. Uh, does, does that mean that in the future we're going to be more vulnerable uh, to uh, more sort of becoming apolitical? Is that a word, like not, uh, basically not having any sort of malfunctioning human traits so we could be easily squashed into a... a well, you're, you're asking, do, do new technologies that interface with our perceptions... Is it going to be connected like, like to... Reco like entities, recording movies and so on, uh, do we... 
can we be influenced by these more than we could previously? Yes, of course, of course we can. Uh, but I don't see yeah. that that's, I don't see that yeah. that, I don't see that that is the, is the, is the big problem for, for us as human beings. Uh, human, human beings have always been influenced by um, sophisticated systems of uh, production of information and experience. So BBC, for example. Uh, I mean, you kind of look at it and you think it was actually not that, not that sophisticated, but when you, when you think about the whole machine and all the parts coming together is very sophisticated uh, means of um, influencing the thoughts of human beings. Okay. And we have a, a variety of, of new uh, perceptual technologies like VR and so on uh, coming into play. Uh, those just amplify the power, the power of the ability to project into the mind. Where I think, what I think is uh, probably the most important development that is happening as far as the fate of human beings is concerned, uh, is that we are getting close to the threshold where the traditional propaganda function uh, that is employed by, you know, BBC, Daily Mail, et cetera, et cetera, cult and cultures also, uh, is, uh, can or can be encapsulated by AI processes. Now, if you think about you, where you're playing chess, or already we're in a situation where AI can do better than the human chess player. So you can see a certain number of moves ahead and someone moves a piece onto the board and you go, well, why, did they, why did they put that knight there? And, and you start to think, what, what is the intentionality behind it? Uh, and then you, you try and look several steps ahead to, to work out what the intentionality was and then counter it. Okay, they want to manipulate me into moving here so this will happen and so I will lose, okay? Uh, but actually, we take these considerations already when we're, well, some of us, uh, when we're reading stories in the press. Uh, what is the intentionality of this story? What, why is this particular information being uh, uh, pushed to the public and not some other form of information? Who's the name of the author? What publication is it appearing in? What language, etc.? Uh, well, possibly the reason was because someone wanted to promote a particular agenda. Well, therefore we should read it in a different light. But when you have artificial uh, intelligence uh, programs harvesting uh, all, the, the, all the search uh, queries that people have on their phones, all the YouTube videos that human beings have uploaded, et cetera, uh, and, and it starts to uh, lay out um, perceptual influence campaigns uh, 20 to 30 moves ahead this starts to become beneath the level of, totally beneath the level of human perception. And once uh, a, a computer augmented organization, such as Google, is able to en engage in uh, influencing human beings 20 to 30 moves ahead, keeping each move beneath the level of human perception, there's nothing we can do about it because we can't see it. So if, if you imagine how this would play out in practice, Let's say uh, Google wants to acquire some company in Russia or China or UK, and it wants to uh, pay as low a price as possible to gain control uh, over that company. So it, it, it starts to look at, well, who are the people who decide to sell shares? Uh, or who are the uh, regulatory administrators uh, who will regulate how it's sold? Uh, who are the pe people who work in it? who ultimately uh, control it, or the computer systems uh, uh, that power it and control parts. And so you can start to engage in a, a campaign of acquisition laid out uh, to make each step beneath the level of human perception uh, and look many moves ahead. And if you can do that more than others can do it, uh, then you win, just like in chess. So. That's where I think we're going in terms of uh, politics. So what is, the, um, if you look at that kind of prediction of the future, we're all doomed from that viewpoint because yeah. the, the, future, the reality becomes invisible. Reality becomes something that is unperceivable uh, by us as individuals. Uh, now to a degree, of course, it already is. 
in many ways unperceivable. But uh, the big changes about control, uh, those become totally unperceivable. So is there, is there any antidote to that? Mm, maybe. Maybe uh, in the competition between these organizations, you, you might maybe you have companies in China trying to do the same thing, uh, backed also by the state. So there's a, a little bit of fratricide, if you like, between these two. Uh, but the, the most immediate way of uh, generating capital from artificial intelligence is to sell access to it. So to sell access, just like Google sells access to Google search, you know, how do they sell it? Well, you sell yourself. What you do is you, you sell what you wanted to search and you sell your attention to Google by searching. That's surveillance capitalism. You give a little bit of your insight into who you are to Google by searching and in exchange, uh, all the resources that it has and its capacities uh, you can use to get the result. Okay, uh, so for, um, so if Google has, uh, insofar as it has a very serious increase in AI capacity, uh, it can lease that AI capacity to uh, other organizations uh, to get um, uh, knowledge about those other organizations uh, in terms of surveillance capital flow uh, or just for money. It's a way, it's a way of getting profit fast uh, for Google. Then it, the question becomes, what is the, what are the various end states? So, so where that in that dynamic of acquisition of capital, exchange of intelligence capacity, uh, who, who ends up winning? Do you end up with basically a diversification like is done to a degree with Google search where, uh, every individual who has access to it uh, is effectively um, uh, effectively ends up with something like the ability that the State Department once had. So you have access to, huge, to enormous archives, mostly laterally produced around the world. Uh, or you move towards a situation uh, where um, Google or an equivalent organization is able to acquire so much more in terms of capital flows, in terms of knowledge about how organizations are working, uh, like you know, collecting what they want to do with this AI capacity, then you can end up with very, very substantial, uh, very, very powerful organizations that are operating at a level beneath what human beings uh, uh, can perceive. And ultimately move into a situation where what human beings are interested in uh, is to becomes totally irrelevant because you have uh, computerized organizations and manufacturing processes and, and automated transport flows, et cetera, which, which make uh, human beings just inefficient and irrelevant. It's not, not like you have some you know, nasty uh, artificial intelligence that wants to decimate the world, but rather human beings become irrelevant and uh, uh, treated uh, like, we, like we treat animals in the, you know, uh, irritating animals like moles, for example, that are you know getting in the way of our ability to use the land for something else. Uh, that's a, it's quite it's quite a, quite a dystopian vision. I, I don't want to you know maybe that maybe there will be a, a new uh, band of uh, uh, of uh, of human beings, technologically empowered human beings that can see this uh, uh, can see this brewing fate. Uh, coming towards us uh, that will uh, be able to extract uh, value or diminish it uh, by directly engaging with it. It's also possible. I was just wondering if, if, if Google has foreseen what might happen if they implement aggressive AI into people's lives and a if machines then start taking care of machines and we become irrelevant, then haven't they already thought of that? Not or really. That I mean, they, they have a, if you look, at this Cor look at this Corbyn situation. Uh, there's a key question. 
all those Blairites that were aggressively attacking Corbyn and, you know, their, their pals in the media, uh, did they not perceive or did they perceive that Corbyn wasn't in their interests or is it both? Did they not perceive reality that uh, with, a, with a breakdown in media controls that uh, someone like Corbyn could get somewhere? Did they not perceive that? Or did they not want to perceive it because they believed that Corbyn wasn't one of them and therefore there couldn't be any useful patronage extracted from him and therefore they opposed him? Did they not perceive or did they perceive that he was not in their interest and therefore they worked against him? I think it, it's, some, it's both, right? That if, if you perceive that not perceiving something uh, is in your interest, then you can be very good at not perceiving it. So when we look at what's happening inside Silicon Valley and what's happening inside Google, uh, there's a sa the same type of uh, deliberate lack of perception about what they're doing. Instead, they create, um, they create uh, a, a, a future nirvana uh, that will come from what they're doing. I mean, they genuinely believe uh, many engineers and, and people like uh, Ray Kurzweil, well, it's kind of well known, but I know from our sources deep inside those Silicon Valley institutions, they genuinely believe that they're going to produce artificial intelligences that are so powerful relatively soon that people will have their brains digitized, uploaded to these artificial intelligences and live forever in a simulation, therefore will have eternal life. It's, a, it's like it's a religion for atheists. They'll have eternal life and given that you're in a simulation, why not program the simulation to have endless uh, drug and sex orgy parties all around you? It's like the 72 virgins, but it's like the Silicon Valley uh, equivalent. And what, what can you do with that? Well, what you can do with that is you can get smart engineers to work for less because they're not just working to increase the profits of Google and Facebook. Uh, they're working towards constructing their own immortality and their own infinite pleasure, and not just for themselves, but for their whole community, and they perceive even for all of humanity itself. That's uh, the, the vision that they have that makes them, makes them work harder. And uh, the dystopian consequences of their work is not what is most present in their mind. Uh, they are aware of the talk, but they engage in rhetorical straw man. So they, they take the talk about, okay, well, maybe, um, maybe uh, uh, producing uh, artificial intelligence that is so sophisticated that human beings can't understand what it's doing is, is a dangerous thing. And they reframe it into some ridiculous straw man. One day, computer becomes conscious, it decides it's a, it's a homicidal maniac uh, and goes around killing everyone. Or we can just put a, like, a little switch on it that, you know, secondary computer program that looks to see where it's becoming homicidal turns it off. Of course you could, but that's not how it will happen in practice. In practice, these artificial intelligences uh, become into being the same way that children become into being, or rather adults become into being through the process of being children, uh, learning about the world. They are learning machines. Uh, the children learn 10 words a day uh, on average and many other things. So they have intense capacity, but they're not, they're not pre-distilled with everything in their brain. They, they harvest from the world. Now, us as human beings have been extremely foolish. Surveillance capitalism as a model has, has, has meant that we have all been in the process of putting our lives onto the internet uh, or Facebook. We're giving our lives over to these Silicon Valley companies. Uh, so these Silicon, so Silicon Valley data stores uh, now have um, a very, very rich um, uh, description of reality as experienced by human beings. And, that, and some bits of data that's not experienced by human beings like stock market indexes and so on. Uh, and that is what these artificial intelligences are trained on. If you look at something like Google, Google Translate, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's pretty hard to learn you know, eight languages let alone 65 languages, that's really remarkable. The, the field of artificial intelligence used to be called 
AIMT, Artificial Intelligence Machine Translation. This machine translation was basically to tap into funding streams uh, from the National Security Agency because they had to translate all their intercepts. Uh, but the machine translation part uh, is basically done. Uh, how, is it, how did that happen? Was it tens of thousands of programmers making lots of uh, grammar rules from all sorts of different languages? No, no, the breakthrough is it's, it's looking at uh, translations of UN speeches and EU um, regulations. And there's language pairs, many, many language pairs of the same document. And with that uh, examples, those Rosetta Stones, millions of Rosetta Stones, uh, you're able to construct a computer which can learn the principles of language and therefore translate. Uh, and we, what we have done is given Rosetta Stones the keys to how hu human beings think and, and our, um, how we manage our political structures and our social structures and our language structures, structures visual and uh, word examples um, in the trillions. Uh, so that's all there. The, the full description of humanity is all there in all its um, beauty, horror, and detail. It's all there to be uh, gleaned from and learned from and extracted like an open cut mine. And you just, you just need to construct uh, well, and it, various types of artificial intelligence are being constructed uh, that then simply mine this out, the collective digitized experience of humanity and so but you can you so, can get so each, so each iteration that you have you know you produce a one percent better artificial intelligence it's able to then extract more from this collective output of humanity it's able to go through the same information and extract more so if you had but if you look at the improvements in the the algorithms and computational speed it's running about 400 500% a year, the computational speed about 200% a year and the, the algorithms you know, another two, 300% a year. So that's a, that's a geometric increase. You know, it's a graph that looks like this. If, even if we're not putting in more data to the internet and we are, just that alone allows you to extract more intelligence, understanding, uh, capital uh, from the collective out, digitized output of humanity. So it's, it's a really um, quite severe situation and it's not properly seen by the people who have the best capacity to see it, i.e. the people who are working on it themselves. They don't perceive it because there's a, a cultural uh, and industrial bias to not perceiving it and instead to supplant what would normally be uh, per, uh, perception of what you're working on with this ridiculous uh, uh, quasi-religious model that it's all going to lead to Nirvana.